America, America, essay, 1963. I went to public schools, genuinely public. Everybody went, the spry, the shy, the podge, the gangler, the future electronic scientist, the future cop who would one night kick a diabetic to death under the mistaken impression he was a drunk and needed cooling off. The poor, smelling of sour wools, and the Uranus baby at home and polyglot stew. The richer, with ratty fur collars, opal birthstone rings, and daddies with cars. What does your daddy do? He don't work. He's a bus driver. Laughter. There it was, education, laid on free of charge for the lot of us, a lovely slab of depressed American public. We weren't depressed, of course. We left that to our parents, who eked out one child or two and slumped dumbly after work and frugal suppers over their radios to listen to news of the, quote, home country, end of quote, and a black-mustached man named Hitler. Above all, we did feel ourselves American in the rowdy seaside town where I picked up, like Lent, my first ten years of schooling. A great loud cat's bag of Irish Catholics, German Jews, Swedes, Negroes, Italians, and that rare pure Mayflower dropping somebody English. On to this steerage of infant citizens, the doctrines of liberty and equality were to be, through the free, communal schools impressed. Although we could almost call ourselves Bostonian, the city airport with its beautiful hover of planes and silver blimps growled and gleamed across the bay, New York skyscrapers were the icons on our homeroom walls. New York and the great green queen lifting a bed lamp that spelled out freedom. Every morning, hands on hearts, we pledged allegiance to the stars and stripes, a sort of aerial altar cloth over teacher's desk, and sang songs full of powder smoke and patriotics to impossible wobbly soprano tunes, one high, Fine song for Purple Mountain Majesties above the fruited plain always made the scampy-sized poet in me weep. In those days, I shouldn't have told a fruited plain from a mountain majesty and confused God with George Washington, whose lamb-like granny face shone down at us also from the schoolroom wall between neat blinders of white curls. Yet warbled, nevertheless, with my small, snotty compatriots, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. The sea we knew something about, terminus of almost every street. It buckled and swashed and tossed out of its gray formlessness. China plates, wooden monkeys, elegant shells and dead men's shoes. Wet salt winds raked our playgrounds endlessly. Those gothic composites of gravel, macadam, granite, and bald flailed earth wickedly designed to bark and scour the tender knee there we traded playing cards for the patterns on the backs and sorted stories jumped clothes rope shot marbles and enacted the radio and comic book dramas of our day quote who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men the shadow knows nya 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 end of quote or quote up in the sky look it's a bird it's a plane it's superman end of quote if we were destined for any special end, grooved, doomed, limited, faded, we didn't feel it. We beamed and sloshed from our desks to the dodgeball dell, open and hopeful as the sea itself. After all, we could be anybody. If we worked, if we studied hard enough, our accents, our money, our parents didn't matter. Did not lawyers rise from the loins of coal heavers, doctors from the bends of dustmen? Education was the answer, and heaven knows how it came to us, invisibly, I think, in the early days. A mystical infrared glow off the thumbed multiplication tables, ghastly poems extolling October's bright blue weather, and a world of history that more or less began and ended with the Boston Tea Party, pilgrims and Indians being, like the Eohippus, prehistoric. Later, the college obsession would seize us, a subtle, terrifying virus. Everybody had to go to some college or other, a business college, a junior college, a state college, a secretarial college, an Ivy League college, a pig farmer's college. The book first, then the work. By the time we, future comp and electronic brain alike, exploded into our prosperous post-war high school, full-time guidance counselors jogged our elbows at every diminishing intervals, ever diminishing intervals, 
to discuss motives, hopes, school subjects, jobs, and colleges. Excellent teachers showered onto us like meteors. Biology teachers holding up human brains. English teachers inspiring us with a personal ideological fierceness about Tolstoy and Plato. Art teachers leading us through the slums of Boston, then back to the easel to hurl public school gauche with social awareness and fury. Eccentricities, the perils of being too special, were reasoned and cooed from us like sucked thumbs. The girl's guidance counselor diagnosed my problem straight off. I was just too dangerously brainy. My high, pure string of straight A's might, without proper extracurricular tempering, snap me into the void. More and more, the colleges wanted all-round students. I had, by that time, time, studied Machiavelli in current events class. I grabbed my cue. Now this guidance counselor owned, unknown to me, a white-haired identical twin I kept meeting in the supermarkets and at the dentists. To this twin, I confided my widening circle of activities, chewing orange sections at the quarters of girls' basketball games I had made the team, painting mammoth little Abners and Daisy Mays for class dances, pasting up dummies of the school newspaper at midnight while my already dissipated co-editor read out the jokes at the bottom of the columns of The New Yorker. The blank, oddly muffled expression of my guidance counselor's twin in the street did not deter me, nor did the apparent amnesia of her whitely efficient double in the school office. I became a rabid teenage pragmatist. Usage is truth. Truth, usage, I might have muttered, leveling my bobby socks to match those of my schoolmates. There was no uniform, but there was a uniform. The page boy hairdo, squeaky clean, the skirt and sweater, the loafers, those scuffed copies of Indian moccasins. We even, in our democratic edifice, nursed two ancient relics of snobbism, two sororities, subdeb and sugar and spice. At the start of each school year, invitation cards went out from old members to new girls, the pretty, the popular, the in some way rivalrous. A week of in initiation preceded our smug admittance to the cherished norm. Teachers preached against initiation week. Boys scoffed but couldn't stop it. I was assigned, like each initiate, a big sister who systematically began to destroy my ego. For a whole week, I could wear no makeup, could not wash, could not comb my hair, change clothes, or speak to boys. By dawn, I had walked to my big sister's house and was making her bed and breakfast. Then, lugging her intolerably heavy books as well as my own, I followed her at a dog's distance to school. On the way, she might order me to climb a tree and hang from a branch till I dropped, ask a passerby a rude question, or stalk about the shops begging for rotten grapes and moldy rice. If I smiled, showed, that is, any sense of irony at my slavishness, I had to kneel on the public pavement and wipe the smile off my face. The minute the bell rang to end school, Big Sister took over. By nightfall, I ached and stank. My homework buzzed in a dulled and muzzy brain. I was being tailored to an okay image. Somehow it didn't take this initiation into the Nile of belonging. Maybe I was just too weird to begin with. What did these picked buds of American womanhood do at their sorority meetings? They ate cake ate cake and catted about the Saturday night date. The privilege of being anybody was turning its other face to the pressure of being everybody, ergo, no one. Lately, I peered through the plate glass side of an American primary school. Child-sized desks and chairs and clean light wood toy stoves and minuscule drinking fountains, sunlight everywhere, all the anarchism, discomfort, and grit I so tenderly remembered had been, in a quarter century, gentled away. One class had spent the morning on a bus, learning how to pay fares and ask for the proper stop. Reading, my lot did it by age four off soapbox tops, had become such a traumatic and stormy art one felt lucky to weather it by ten. But the children were smiling in their little ring, did I glimpse, in the first aid cabinet, a sparkle of bottles, soothers and smootheners for the embryo rebel, the artist, the odd, 